working on the vitality of the English speaking community has a vested interest in being able to collaborate with French speakers and French language institutions. So we've already done the introduction, so I'm gonna skip this along. Okay. So um, Eric, I'm gonna give you hosting rights. Did you wanna control your own PowerPoint or did you yes. want me to? Okay, great. Yes, I, uh, I will. We, uh, we did a dry run this morning and it, it worked. So <laughs> uh, it should be fine. So let me uh, share my screen and we'll see. Host disabled participant screen sharing. So can you enable it for me? Absolutely. Um, maybe try now. Just yes. made you a co-host. Yeah, it, I know it should be working. Okay. Do you see now my screen? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Great. All right, Great. Eric. Please take us yep. away. Well, well thank, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, the, the, the last time we met, uh, we discussed we discussed the um, uh, the key uh, factors that help to enhance uh, the vitality of community uh, minorities. And as you mentioned. One of the key factor is the relationship with the majority. Uh, so today I'm, I'm going to uh, emphasize on this uh, relationship and to introduce uh, a second framework that help us uh, achieve our policy objectives. Um, during the breakout sessions the, the, last, uh, the last time, uh, I, I took note of some of your comments. Um, some of you mentioned working on that working on common outcomes regardless of the language group it's important uh, learning to collaborate with the same goal bridging school systems um, it's a key issue to get attention to get positive receptions of, of the majority uh, does count um, to experiment new type of partnership between english speaking and french speaking organizations is important and often there are mis misunderstanding of people have uh, prejudice uh, prejudice so this everything i, I heard well Many of these uh, uh, of the comments you, you made the other day uh, remember me that well maybe the reality framework is also um, relevant for what you do and so that's that's the goal uh, of today um, to to go more in depth uh, in that regard. Of course, uh, there are another reason why we developed. Um, the directive framework it's one of the two obligations um, that you can find in the official languages act uh, under part seven this is the red part of the of my slide so uh, at the social level um, there are two obligations two commitments um, for federal institutions the, the first one it's the development of community minorities and we did talk about it the other day but the second commitment is the promotion of duality and to foster, um, which is to foster appreciation and cooperation. Um, some people will say, well, it's the, it's the promotion of the living together. C'est le vivre ensemble en francophone et anglophone. So today I'm going to introduce the second framework that help us achieve or meet uh, the obligations of the part seven of, of, the, of the official Ling languages act. And another reason as well, why other federal institutions uh, have an interest. Um, well, first, first of all, it's everybody, everybody business. So part seven, it's, it's not only uh, about Canadian heritage, all federal institutions must promote duality. But since uh, 2005, uh, the commitment uh, of promoting duality uh, was made enforceable. So it means that it's a uh, justiciable. It could be appealed to the courts if not if not enough uh, is being made so it, it it did help other federal institutions that we um, develop a tool to better understand the implications of um, of this engagement of this obligation of promoting duality um, and as well there is a provision in the act that requires canadian heritage to promote a, a coordinated approach to the implementation of part seven so that's the reason why we developed uh, the following tool within our department. And at the end um, of my presentation, you probably see um, well, the, the expected results uh, of this framework is to better explain our policy objectives, to better guide our actions, to promote living together, to better understand the state of relations, of, of relations between the two language groups, and maybe to contribute to the understanding uh, of, of other federal institutions. 
I should mention as well, uh, one of the drivers uh, of this work, uh, yeah, um, I, I should mention that as well, one of, another driver of this work was our, our, our last evaluation, uh, program evaluation that says, when linguistic duality relies on solid le legislative foundations. There's no, no question about that. But the objective, the, um, the clear objective or the, the clear outcomes are not, are not there yet, so we were invited to develop a more uh, uh, measurable uh, or tangible uh, set of results to, uh, to be met uh, by, by promoting duality. So that's, that's also a response to our latest uh, program evaluation. As well, we were to, uh, the, the call for more uh, applied research was also made from um, over time from various uh, um, official languages uh, commissionnaire. Donc, plusieurs commissaires aux langues officielles uh, ont on, on fait part de leur, de leur souhait uh, d'avoir plus d'action en matière de promotion de la dualité. One of the, of the key comments uh, that you can find in, in a recent report uh, from the commissionnaire was that federal institutions have always paid uh, special attention to the community development component of, of the law, and this is great, uh, and, but it has been done to some extent uh, to the detriment of the promotion of component of part seven. Uh, and, some, um, and you can find many recommendations uh, for federal institutions that can, that can help us understand what they mean by uh, promotion, promoting duality. Uh, it, it means uh, to enable more Canadians for di from different linguistic backgrounds to see, hear, and learn about each other to promote opportunities for dialogue and exchange, particularly among young people. Um, as well, the city of Ottawa um, is a key player, is a key institution um, that must project a, a faithful image of Canada's linguistic duality uh, to residents of the region, and more importantly, to hundreds of thousands of Canadians and foreign visitors uh, who stay there each year. And also maybe of interest for what you do, the absence of a true continuum of langu language learning opportunities for Canadians as the effect of compromising the acquisition of language skills that are increasingly in demand, both in the public and private and in private sectors and, and so on. So there are many uh, recommendations or suggestions made over time uh, in these reports. Uh, so we did here um, uh, in 2019, um, during the, the 50th anniversary of the Official Languages Act, we did hear some sort of cry from the heart, un cri du cœur, by many people, um, from many people. Uh, Graham Fraser, uh, who mentioned that linguistic duality has not been promoted in over 20 years. As well, we have a duty to foster cultural understanding. We should also further structure the encounter between francophones and immersion from Canadian parents for French. Um, as well, uh, Michel Bastarach, former uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, the majorities should be invited so that they can form their own ideas of, of the matter. So what do French speaking Quebecers think, think about duality? What about uh, the English Canada outside Quebec? We, we must invite these people as well uh, for, uh, into the discussion. Um, uh, and we also heard um, uh, Robert Melanson from uh, La Société de l'Acadie du Nouveau-Brunswick who said uh, linguistic duality is, is much more than access to services in French. Um, uh, and we already heard probably that was Graham Fraser in the past uh, on the same lines, he, he said um, uh, the, the, the duality um, uh, is a way of conceiving uh, of, of ourselves as a political entity. It's much more than just an accommodation that is made for a minority of people. And we, we can find as well uh, within the society uh, a desire, a, a support for uh, linguistic duality, because at the end of the day, we also want to be relevant to the social reality of today and of tomorrow. So we can pick some of the, um, of the latest surveys uh, around support of linguistic duality, for instance. Um, in Quebec, uh, about 65% of, of, of uh, Quebecers uh, interact with people who speak the other official language, at least occasionally. Um, and it, goes, uh, it drops to 20% in the rest of the country. 66% uh, of Quebecers use me, the media, 
the media in the other official language, such, such as television, radio, internet, at least occasionally, and it, go, it drops to 25% outside uh, the province. Um, about 60% of Quebecers consume cultural products in the other official language. Uh, 99 Oh, well, that's quite, uh, quite high. Uh, almost everybody finds it important that their children have the opportunity to learn the other official language and become bilingual in Quebec. Uh, and this is uh, outside Quebec, uh, uh, around 70% of support. Other angles uh, of duality, 70% uh, in Quebec, 70% of people agree that having the two official languages is an important part of what it means to be Canadian. About 80% see linguistic duality in Canada as a source of cultural enrichment. 90% support language programs as a way to encourage understanding between French speaking and English speaking uh, Quebecers, Canadians. Also about 80% believe that learning both official languages contribute to a better understanding among Canadians. Uh, well, the, the next one is not, <laughs> Too good for us, but uh, <laughs> public servants. Uh, um, don't, uh, so, 41 percent believe that the government of Canada is effective in protecting both official languages. Maybe there is a call for more action. Six, 70 percent think that in their region, the relations between anglophones and francophones are more positive today than they were 10 years ago. And we can go. Uh, we can look also at the ability to understand the other official language. Um, uh, interesting to know that, of course, in Quebec, there is more ability to understand the, of, the other official language compared to uh, the rest of the country. Um, within Quebec, and, but we must be careful before using this, these data because the sample size is maybe too small, but you know, it gives some indication. So in terms of uh, ability to understand the other official language, uh, about 70% of, of Anglophones in Quebec have an uh, advanced knowledge compared to 50% of Francophones. And in terms of intermediate knowledge, uh, we talk about 25% of Francophones have, that have intermediate knowledge compared to 10% of Anglophones in Quebec. But overall, overall it says that uh, English speakers in Quebec are more bilingual. Um, Ability to speak the other official language, same story. If you compare Quebec with the rest of Canada, there is more ability to speak the other official language in Quebec. Uh, Quebec is really a distinct society in that regard. And, um, and finally, the ability to speak the other official language um, um, but it, it, it's higher among uh, English-speaking Quebecers, um, uh, as we saw in the, uh, the previous side, slide. So the, in Canadian society, there, there is something there uh, that support more actions and uh, understanding of each other. So we have a proposal to make. Um, a few years ago, we, we launched a pilot project in Quebec. Uh, the reason why we started to uh, develop this framework in Quebec, uh, uh, well, uh, first of all, um, uh, the living together um, makes the front page of the media very often in Quebec. And uh, the second place would be probably a New Brunswick uh, in, occasionally in Ontario. Uh, but uh, also in Quebec um, in 2017, we had um, a good uh, grasp of um, the perceptions of uh, French speaking and English speaking youth. Um, youth English, English speaking Quebecers uh, most often are bilingual and they want to integrate and fully participate in French speaking Quebec. Uh, however, uh, our studies uh, have shown that although they are, these young people do not consider themselves a minority, they do not always feel included in Quebec society. And on the other hand, among young French speaking Quebecers, re research indicates a paradigm shift regarding the perception of English Many consider English to be essential skill in the workplace and in the context of globalization. So there was a good timing maybe to, um, to have a reflection uh, around uh, living together in Quebec. We did work with uh, quite interesting working group, um, representative from Cégep Champlain Saint Lawrence, uh, l'Association Québécoise pour le Français, le Centre d'études ethniques des universités, Secrétariat à la jeunesse du gouvernement du Québec, Donc ça, c'est au, au conseil exécutif. So this is these people, this person, Isabelle Champagne, uh, work at the private council, for the private council in Quebec. So that was quite important to have the, um, the buy-in of the, 
Government, the Government of Quebec, euh, Université de Sherbrooke, Benoît Côté, l'Institut du Nouveau Monde, euh, Youth for Youth Quebec, uh, with Macomb, Lewis uh, Richmond, Université Laval, Conseil jeunesse du Premier ministre, Justin Trudeau, and so on, so, uh, or Paul Zanzania, University of McGill. So we had a very uh, interesting um, uh, and very uh, efficient working group. These people didn't know necessarily each other, some of them, yes, but not all. And at the end of, of our of a part of project, there was um, a great interest to, to stay in touch. Uh, so that's that was that was a very uh, a fantastic pilot project. We were lucky to uh, uh, to have the resources to do it. Uh, now the uh, the approach we took uh, we took into uh, consideration a, a few concepts: um, the balance of power between minority groups and the dominant culture. Um, the conditions that allow the meeting between the two groups to occur, between two groups to occur in a positive way and create a, a rapprochement. Um, historical awareness. So this is, it comes from uh, Paul Zanzania, uh, his research. So it's the ability to develop, a, to have a, to be able to develop a critical distance from the past, uh, to allow an, an openness to the perspective of others. Also, we did include considerations about linguistic security, security or insecurity that is possible. So linguistic security is possible when the two, the, the groups that interact are equal and have the perceptions of a, having equal status. Everything to say that um, we, uh, I, I believe we did our homeworks, I hope. Uh, we did our literature review and we, we had a good sounding board uh, through the, the people I named uh, in Quebec. And we, we did some validation of the model outside the, uh, outside the province. Uh, and also um, we make sure that it, will, it could apply to the entire population. So what do we have now? The framework is, um, is represented as a three-level target. Uh, and for each level, uh, we define objectives to clarify how we can intervene. Um, so to, to start with, um, uh, before, there is an, there, before talking about appreciation of the other linguistic group or even opportunities for co cooperation, uh, we must have the opportunity to get to know the other linguistic group. Uh, whether through uh, its culture, history, or contact with its language. Um, and of course, the it, it, it's, it's being made possible through the education system, visibility in the public space, uh, through the cultural industries, uh, performing arts. Uh, and of course, living in a region like Montreal, where there, there is a significant concentration of English speakers and French speakers often creates more opportunities to be exposed to, to the other linguistic group, which is not the case uh, everywhere in the country. Uh, it's in, uh, 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 some, uh, in, in the rest of, of the country. Uh, it is important as well to remember there is no requirement to be bilingual to get to know the other better. The reading of great uh, authors' uh, works uh, translated into our own mother tongue uh, make, makes it possible to better understand the culture of the other. And there are four, um, four dimensions of this uh, first level, the exposure, the, the knowledge of the other. Uh, one dimension is about the production, access, and consumption of, of culture, uh, again, in their uh, original version or through translation. Um, also, there is a, a need for a recognition in Canadian society of the, uh, uh, to promote linguistic duality. Here we're talking about we're thinking about key stakeholders, uh, governments, municipalities, businesses, um, union labor organizations. They all they all have a role to promote linguistic duality uh, um, across the country uh, uh, in Quebec. There is also um, a need for a better uh, an objective is a better awareness of perceptions. So being able to identify our own. Um, stereotypes or negative stereotypes we, we may have associated with the other uh, linguistic group. Um, there is also an objective for um, to achieve a more complex understanding of, of the other linguistic group in terms of needs and perspective, historical perspective. 
the seven, second level uh, of the framework talks about appreciation. So we're moving from contact to interactions. Um, and the objectives are the recognitions of the immediate and permanent benefits benefits of being bilingual, either a benefit from the, the person or from the or for the society as a whole. Uh, increased linguistic security, um, uh, or to be or to say it otherwise, uh, to be sensitive to the linguistic and security of, of the others. Um, enhancement of communication skills, that's the level of bilingualism that we, we want, may want to increase uh, under this uh, appreciation uh, intervention. And as well, um, uh, the appreciation is also about the identification and appreciation of commonalities and differences. So uh, being able to identify what we have in common with the, with, uh, uh, the other group and what are our, what are our, what are our differences. Um, and the last level of, uh, of duality is, is all about cooperation. And really here we're talking about long-term uh, uh, relationship, deeper personal investment and engagement. And there are four, four outcomes, um, increase awareness of my, of my role as a cultural and linguistic passer. Um, and this is the, a role that can be at the individual level, but also from an, an organization like your organization to promote closer ties between the two linguistic groups and to act as a mediator in building close relationships. Um, it's, also, it's also to, um, to have a common purpose, a common goal, we discuss it uh, in February, um, as well as the trust between both parties and the recognitions of their interdependence in order to fulfill their common goal. Um, a, a third objective, a result, is the inclusion in a lasting social network. And finally, it's the development of some sort of empathy, which is the ultimate goal of uh, cooperation. Of course, we um, we didn't wait for this frame, frame, to add this framework before uh, acting, uh, before uh, taking actions. So for years now, we have been funding second language learning. Uh, we have been supporting uh, organizations that are experts in linguistic duality. I'm referring, uh, well, I think about, we can refer to Canadian Parents for French, French for the Future, um, La Fondation Canadienne pour le dialogue et culture. Uh, we also um, have one-time projects under the Appreciation and Rapprochement Program. Uh, you can find examples from the annual reviews of federal institutions. Um, and we do have on our website, canada.ca, um, uh, a guide that shows the best practices uh, taken in, in a variety of federal institutions. And provincial and territories uh, also have some initiatives around the living together or the promotion of uh, the living together, promotion of duality. What are our next steps? Uh, well, um, this framework is now available uh, on, on our website um, and we'll probably share uh, the links uh, later on with you. So the variety faculty framework, the duality framework and the best practices. Um, the, our next step is to better measure the state of relations between the two language groups. If you take the three level of, um, of duality, how can we measure uh, um, uh, the, the state of the relation? Uh, are there problems uh, at what level uh, and so on? We would like to highlight uh, the best, keep highlighting the best practices. We would, we, of course, we want to build arguments for more interventions. And I invite you to do the same <laughs> from your side. So internally, we'll try to, to build arguments. And uh, we would like to advance uh, on three major real world applications uh, representing unique and important issues. These three, um, j'appelle en français les trois cas d'espèce, uh, it's l'adhésion of Quebec to linguistic duality. Uh, I'm thinking about. French Quebec here. Um, it's not clear how familiar uh, French speakers in Quebec, um, uh, how familiar they are with legal and political recognitions that applies to them and to the Francophone outside uh, Quebec. Um, also, um, 
the federal government does respect uh, the legal measure or the measures um, taken, legitimate measure taken by Quebec to promote uh, and protect French. So French Quebecers should know that. Um, um, we really need to engage Quebec. If Quebec does not does not support duality, uh, that's it's it's a bad starting point outside uh, in the rest of the country. Uh, the second case, important case, the city of Ottawa. We 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 didn't mention that before. We should reflect. Uh, the city of Ottawa should better reflect Canada bilingual character. And uh, finally, uh, on the international scene, um, through its relationship with other countries, um, Canada has exceptional opportunities to assert its bilingual character. Um, and thus highlight the richness of its duality. And that's so that's another um, special intervention that we um, were pushing for. So that will be that will complete my presentation for now. And so I turn thank you, I turn Eric. To you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Eric, maybe I can oh great, we can see you again. Yay. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for that. I mean, what I like about the framework is it really just gives language, I think, and articulates some of the relational work that, that takes place, I think, within our networks and beyond. And, and, you know, sometimes I think we don't talk enough about this stuff. Um, we get so focused on outputs in terms of programming outputs and things like that. We don't necessarily look at relational outputs. So I like that this framework kind of draws our attention to that. Um, if anybody has questions for Eric at this point, I'd invite you to um, share those in the in the chat. And yeah, Melanie, um, would you like to comment? I do actually. Uh, Eric, if you're still presenting, can you go back to the framework, please, to the circles? Yes. Thank you. Just a little, I mean, I, it flashed at me when I was looking at it um, during your presentation. So. I'm, I'm very familiar, Lynn is online, so hi Lynn, <laughs> but I'm very familiar with your roles as, as CLC coordinators and development agents, but the way that I've seen it, and for years, and I'm really liking this image, is it's kind of a breathing space, right, that your role is, you're kind of right in the middle, you know, at level three, let's say, and if you permit me, I, I will just say it's like breathing, so whether you're starting from empathy, inclusion, a common project or whatever, and going outward, um, because the, the effect will be more understanding, awareness, recognition, and um, consumption of, of cultural and or other products, or going at it the other way, starting from the edge and going towards the middle, you're kind of that, you're creating that breathing space for partners to get together and, and sort of connect on either one of those levels, whether you're starting from the middle or from the edge, but that'll be the effect that whatever cooperation that's done through these lenses will have on the community in a microcosm, let's say, of what the government's trying to do with this um, with this approach. So I just wanted to add that. Absolutely, well said. I think um, maybe just to compliment that, Ben and I had prepared just a couple of examples for, for everyone about what this kind of framework looks like in action. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier, I think this is the work of CLCs, this is the work of NPIs and many other community based organizations seeking to support the English speaking community. So we have drawn examples from our extended network, if you will, um, just to give a little bit of a concrete example to, to how this works and how it looks in action. So Ben's going to kick us off with uh, a couple of examples, uh, I believe, implicating the Maison des Jeunes. Is that right, Ben? Exactly. Sure. So um, do you want to put up the slide that we um, sure. created? Just a nice image or, or even, you know, you know what? We can put it up for a second, then um, we can take it down just so we can see um, Anthony. So um, I mean, this is really builds off Melanie's um, uh, comment. So a few days ago, I was having a great conversation with Anthony Spadaccino from the New Frontier School Board. So Anthony, are you there? Anthony, are you are you there? Okay. Oh, yes, no? Man, I'm come. right here. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I was going to tell the story for you. I'll give my wait, camera. Wait, wait. No, I'm here. I'm plugging everything. Because <laughs> so, I have so, my chargers gone and my camera's sticking up the battery. So, so, so when he, too many so rooms have been switching and I apologize, guys. No, no problem at all. So <laughs> do you want to tell like the short version of the, the Maison 
Maison yes. Desjardins story or the partnership table. And then I'm going to like put the, the framework lens on top. So like take it away for two minutes or so. Yes. So well, and in a nutshell, we've, we've uh, been working on with the high school, trying to find a little more bilingual services to better support our youth. Uh, I've been working with an organization, Maison Desjardins, for years. They felt they didn't have access to the building. And I explained to them the reasoning behind it, where yes, we live in Quebec. And yes, the main language is French, but we do have an Anglophone population and we need to meet them halfway. They've uh, recently hired two bilingual workers, and we've had them since the beginning of the year. Uh, sorry, since the holidays come in one full day a week, paid by Maison des Jeunes to better support our youth. Uh, Maison des Jeunes has opened up their doors with these bilingual workers, so our students are able to use uh, their services during lunch hour. And after school, they've had between 25 and 50 youth from the high school now use their services just at lunch, not including weekend events that they've been uh, hosting. So it was basically just working with them and seeing what we can support them with since we are uh, a bilingual service, but we do have Anglophone support for them. And they met us halfway where we helped them to staff and it worked out, it was a great win-win. Great, Th thanks Anthony for, Thank for you. painting that picture. So I heard this story, I looked at the linguistic framework and for me, what stood out was the level two appreciation. So, um, you know, the sense of like linguistic security for the youth the opportunity to come together, express themselves, feeling safe and accepted. And my assumption of, of the Maison des Jeunes is like their goal is healthy, happy, vibrant young people, whatever language they speak. And so knowing that they're meeting them halfway in that way and also bringing them in and, and having the kind of commonalities um, that might take place between youth and youth workers or youth, English speaking youth and, and, Frank of, and French speaking youth to like to meet themselves um, and appreciate each other's um, gifts uh, in whatever language they speak and, and providing those opportunities uh, to promote living together. I also saw a level three connection with cooperation. So again, um, the CLC school, the, the workers at the Maison, Maison des Jeunes having a common purpose and being those passeurs of like linguistic and cultural mediation, like music that's playing, um, just having a space where, where they can have these, um, this crossover and dialogue on both sides. And lastly, I'll just say empathy, uh, empathizing with um, the linguistic minority status of English speaking youth and Anthony expressing empathy to the Maison des Jeunes of like, we get that you like, this is a, um, your, your staff may not speak English as their first language, but like, but anything you can do is, is appreciated. So that's kind of where I saw those connections. So I pass it back to, uh, to Emma. Thank you, Ben. Um, it looks like Sarah might have an example for us. Sarah, did you want to maybe speak to this for, for a moment? Oh, I can. Like, I've been, we're an NPI, so like we're not from the, uh, from the school board per se, but I'm starting to establish link to key person and mostly it's with the uh, Ressources Educatives. And so they agreed like for about once a month, not more than that, that I will send them an email gathering all of the events that our organization is hosting. And one key things that I had to make sure is that every word had to be bilingual. <laughs> so the posters, usually I attached a poster, I had to remove them and I had like to make sure that the chart highlighting the events were in both languages. And but like on the and first one is the French uh, the the French version and saying the English version it's a following and to make sure that highlighted and bold and underlined I have like these events are hosted in English but and the school board will uh, kindly forward the information not to all of the family but those that are targeted into their system as English speaking families or uh, uh, immigrants that they, they will understand more the English than French. So That's slowly, good. yeah, so slowly it's getting there. That's great, Sarah. And, you know, I think for those of us working in education, that's a hard to reach population, right? Uh, reaching English speakers in the French school system is typically considered a pretty hard thing to do. So good for you <laughs> for finding a way to get in there. Um, there's a lot of complexity to this work. 
Um, the, the other example I wanted to share with you guys, um, and I think there's people in the room who will be familiar with this example to some extent, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about the uh, journey of the Richmond, uh, Richmond, Danville, and Drummondville region CIC. So this is a quote. I, I did like a little quick and dirty interview with Sue and Jim, who's one of the two coordinators for the CLC. And you know, I, this just really stuck with me. My French is far from perfect. I showed up anyway. And she's talking about showing up at the Cab de France at Casso. I'm willing to give, and that makes a difference. So 10 years ago, the Suman has been with us a while. 10 years ago, Suman started showing up at Cab de France at Casso in her region with very rudimentary French. She grew up in Ontario, um, but she was committed to learning it. And she still felt that she had a place at that table and that she could offer things to that table. And in doing so, you know, it began a long-standing relationship that has over time become increasingly more generative. So, you know, she's uh, the, the story I'm gonna walk you guys through is, is a brief one, but she goes through kind of all of the levels, level one, level two, level three. So level one for awareness. When she first, first started, started going to the tables, she also started inviting partners to come to the school or come to events to learn more about the English speaking community in the region. So she of course worked closely with township or other partners to gather the information that was available. She started hosting regular events, creating documents that she could share out with targeted partners to let them know how the needs of the English speaking community might be a little bit different um, than the French speaking community, or even just disproportionate too, right? So in their region, for example, um, French speaking youth mostly attended uh, preschool programming prior to coming into school, but English speaking youth were not. So, so, you know, there's a bit of a nuance there in terms of who needs what. So for this CLC, an important area of focus, much like our MPIs, is how are we going to mobilize our partners to offer health and social services in English? And how are we going to, in particular, mobilize them to offer early childhood education opportunities in English? So this was the beginning of a long-term haul. And I think they've had quite a bit of success. Um, and, and, you know, she credits this to just being in an ongoing relationship with people. Right, so once they started to become aware, once they started to develop a more complex understanding of the linguistic group, which by the way, worked both ways, um, they then started developing a little bit more of an appreciation for the differences. And the other thing that, you know, Suman told me that has stuck with me is, you know, the French speaking organizations that she was working with, like the Suez, et cetera, it wasn't always a question of la volonté, right? Like sometimes we think they're not willing, but she, would learn occasionally that it was actually a question of capacity. So they didn't necessarily have access to bilingual staff. They didn't necessarily have access to funding that could support translation. So that's when you, know, you start seeing the value of some of these collective impact initiatives. So the CLC you know, encourages them to work with organizations like townshippers who may be able to secure funding um, for the English speaking community or okay, we're gonna connect you to this volunteer group in the community, et cetera. So they started targeting things with their partners and they started pooling resources where they could to fill the gaps. But one of the big takeaways from partners was the importance of actually speaking to the English language community, presenting themselves as accessible, as open to them, maybe even creating content that would be available to them in their language, advertising services. So of course, the CLC can, is, is not trying to take all credit for all things. I really mean this, but it becomes a collective impact, right? When you're a large number of organizations working toward this stuff, I would argue it, it's almost impossible <laughs> to tease out who gets to take credit for it, and it's beside the point. I think the real point is when we start coming together, we start working on the same team, we start finding solutions within our community to some of these barriers. So, over 10 years, you know, a lot of these groups worked together. And this was one thing that it culminated in was, you know, they had a virtual health and wellness fair. And all of the partners, including the CLC, um, created these short videos in English for community members. Because one of the things that came out is the English language community didn't necessarily know what was available to them in their backyard. Because at the time, everything was being promoted and communicated in French. 
So again, this is a joint initiative, but everybody sort of created these short and I think kind of lovely videos explaining what they do. Some of these organizations were motivated to start recruiting English language volunteers in larger numbers to hire bilingual staff moving forward. These are real and tangible changes. The very way that they plan in the region has been transformed. It's no longer the case that some of these health partners plan in isolation. It's become a collective planning zone, right? Where English language partners are at the table. They're invited to be there and they're considered important and relevant players and ditto in reverse, right? So anyway, this is, I thought just a lovely example. If you'll bear with me, I was hoping to maybe play for you guys uh, just one or two of these, I think, charming videos. <laughs> is everybody okay with that? Is everybody up for a short video? Okay, great. Um, here. Are you guys seeing my YouTube page? Okay, great. Let me play this one first. Can you hear? Okay, hold on, I'll fix it. And it's Feeder Elementary School. The Richmond, Danville, and Drummondville area CLC her Community Learning Center encompasses Richmond Regional High School and its feeder elementary schools, St. Francis, ADS, and Drummondville Elementary. Together, we take a collaborative approach with a wide range of partners who share our goals of supporting students, their families, and the English-speaking community that the schools belong to. With these partnerships, we've been able to help bring programs for the English-speaking population of all ages, from parents with new babies, preschoolers getting ready to start school, students and their parents, and even to our community's seniors. Our programs are offered in English, but any public activities are always open to the entire community. We also help facilitate the involvement of community partners in classroom activities and school-wide projects. Be sure to connect with us to find out about all the opportunities available. You can reach us at your nearest CLC school or follow us on Facebook. It's short, it's sweet, and I love that they're kind of using their relationship with the English speaking community to like, you know, let them know that they're also in relationship with these service providers, right? It's almost like leveraging the trust they've established with families and letting them know um, that they are intentionally trying to bring in these partners to work. And this is the last video I'll show is Meet the Cab. They're all quite charming, but this one, for whatever reason, I just think these two are, are adorable. If I'm allowed saying that out loud, but I just do. I'm going to play this video for you guys and let me know if you agree. The Richmond Volunteer Center, also known as the CAB or the Centre d'Action Bénévole, coordinates and promotes volunteer services for the whole community. Some of our services for seniors include Meals on Wheels, accompanied transportation and help running errands, friendly visits and phone calls, and a medical alert service. And all of these services are also available for anyone with a loss of autonomy. And other programs include Viactive, an adapted exercise program, income tax clinics for low-income wage earners, and other services such as help to plan a budget, fill out forms, access government programs, or just find local resources. There is a seniors group and a caregivers support group, and English speakers are more than welcome. We even sometimes offer special programs like Jog Your Mind. <laughs> Help us get the word out. Tell your friends and family about the GAP, the Richmond Volunteer Center. And don't be shy to use our services. Or sign up as a volunteer, because it's all about building a stronger community together. How charming are those two? Come on. <laughs> Shock in memory. Um, okay, last uh, last little piece on the CLC. They're actually um, planning a 10 year anniversary party. Uh, kind of forward. They're trying to get their community back out and engaging. And, and guess who volunteered to co organize it with them? The CS, right? So <laughs> it's just to say they have these partners now who used to be very distant, they operate very much in French. Um, but they are increasingly wanting to be at the center of this work. And I think that is a big win for everyone in the community. So that's that's it for the example that I wanted to share. I think, Melanie, I saw your hand up. Yeah, go ahead. 
I was waiting. I, I didn't know when to intervene, but I used to, before I was at Heritage Lower St. Lawrence, before I was at PCH, um, I was a community collective impact coordinator, let's say. In French, we call it concertation for like an MRC. So this is a model that I've, I've helped um, develop as well. And I have two things that I, that I want to say. So one thing is the partners, if they don't see English speakers at the table, then they don't realize what the needs are. And also they might not even see the opportunities for collaboration. It's kind of, you know, it, it keeps the divide divided, let's say. Um, and sometimes it doesn't have to be a CLC coordinator or development agent, but if you partner with your vitality organization or with others who can, you know, maybe you're on one committee and then another is on another committee and so on, and you develop this approach about the needs of your community and your school, then everybody is kind of owning those files and owning those needs and, and can represent, right? And then can connect each other to the right resources and set up, you know, a work meeting instead of having to go through 10, you know, table meetings, let's say. That's, that's an opportunity. And I, I can't stress enough how those collaborations to represent are also important because I know that you only have so many hours in a work week. So getting that impact from a collective approach is also very important because you can double your, your own impact. And the other thing I wanna say is a lot of these Francophone resources and organizations, they don't have capacity to offer a lot of services in English, but if they develop a collaboration with you or with your communities, then they see that as an advantage for them as well. So it's not only that they're not aware, but sometimes they just don't know where to start. And it's happened that, you know, when I was at Heritage, let's say, I helped, you know, develop a guide for elder abuse. Well, it was translated into English, even though there's only 250 Anglophones in this MRC, let's say. But the guide, there was a significant portion of the money that was kept for translation into English because we were at that table and they thought it was just so because we were there, it's normal to get it translated and we helped get a little bit of funding for that. But they also reserved a big chunk of the funding for the translation when they did get a bit of money to produce it. So in a sense, and there were you know presentations done in English and all that kind of stuff. So in a sense, it was very fortunate, but it was also very strategic for us to be there. So if there's different issues that you feel you know, necessitate a little bit more effort or impact or representation, you can even choose, you know, where you're going to be, but not just to develop projects or whatever, but to, to eventually be able to collectively address those issues and pool resources together. I think that's the most important part. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's it. No, don't be sorry. That's why you're here. <laughs> we want you to talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is good. Um, I wanted to give everybody in the room a bit of a chance to, to think about this stuff um, in their own context. So I'm going to pop a couple of questions in the chat for reflection. Um, I'm going to actually give you guys two minutes of silence to read them and consider for yourselves individually before we do a, a short breakout. Um, I'll press enter now. So hopefully you can see those questions in the chat. I'll put them up on my screen as well, just because it might be easier for you to see. And I'm gonna mute myself and I'm gonna encourage everybody to take the next couple of minutes to read these questions and consider you know, your, your answers from, from your lens, from your context. Hi, everybody. I um, hope you've had a moment to reflect on some of these different questions. We're running a little bit um, short on time. So I think we're going to skip the breakout, but we do want to hear um, some people's responses to these reflection questions. Um, you know, we've already heard ways that bridges are being built. Um, so yeah, we'd love to hear some comments. Stephanie, I see your hand up. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to just briefly say something. Um, it's quite interesting about the organizations and everything. So I sit at a table in Verdun, and I'm the only Anglophone at that table. Uh, it's all French uh, organizations that, that show up at the uh, meetings. And there's one particular organization that is working so hard to get into my high school right now that uh, they've given free pizza lunches to my kids. 
They donated uh, school supplies in my CLC room. Uh, and it's, it's sad to say, but my students will often say, but aren't they a French organization? Because they're very popular in the Francophone schools around the area. And uh, I just think it's really nice when you get to meet organizations that really want to work with the Anglophone community. Uh, and eventually, hopefully, we hope to collaborate the schools as well because these children play hockey together and baseball together and soccer. And then when it comes to the school time, we're very, very separated. So um, my, main, my main thing is that there's so many French organizations that want to work with us. And I think that uh, as uh, CDAs, we have to open our mind to that. And I've, I've learned that there's, there's really good ones in my community. Absolutely. And, you know, this is a, a, an interesting challenge to, to find the right, uh, the right way to, to solve that, not solve the problem, but to like, you know, have uh, more openness among your students to benefit. So that, that's great. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Lynn Bruce. Hi, um, and I'm sure Melanie can back this up uh, in our community. Of course, a lot of all, all our local committees uh, in general, the majority are French and excuse the expression, but my French sucks. So it's been an interesting uh, journey, but I'm actually on at too many tables now. But being at those tables, I've received a lot of services and support for the school. But um, it's basically, and the French school, we haven't been able to inter interact with as much as we'd like, uh, only due to COVID. But pre-COVID, we did a lot of um, activities, uh, sporting events, stuff like that with them. Um, it's just that because we don't have a choice in my area, there are no English committees, uh, or very few anyways. So it's uh, basically, it's just volunteering and getting on all the committees, sitting at the tables, and that's how we're getting, the well, that's how I'm getting a lot of support. Great, great. thank I you like for sharing. That, and, and, I, and I think your region is kind of interesting, right? Because I think when we're in big cities, we, we seem to feel like we have choices. And sometimes I think it's easy to convince ourselves that it's not as important to partner with these Francophone organizations, but, but it is truthfully, right? Like oh, yeah. some of these major institutions like healthcare, right? It's, it's operated predominantly through the CS, which is predominantly French. So in your case, Lynn, it's interesting because you're in a region where you, do, you don't have that sense of luxury, right? Where you have choice, no. you know you need to do it. No, I, I always, I mean, I joke about it, but I'm, I'm just the token Anglophone everywhere, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it works, so. She does say that too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lynn. Uh, David. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm mindful for the time, so I'm, I'm not going to say too much, but I just want to highlight uh, an organization that our school partnered with and I would recommend all of us to to take a look at it. It's, and I think uh, Mr. Jenkins mentioned it before too. It is a Canadian Parents for French, the CPF, uh, they, and they have offices all over Canada. And they're so willing to help us uh, us out or, or any English institution help us to help um, and they give grants too. So we took their grant and we partnered with uh, Zoo Therapy. So uh, an organization that comes with actual animals. So either rabbits, dogs, ferrets, even came with rats one time. The kids loved it, but I thought it was a bit weird. And then they, they, they read to the kids in uh, French and helps them like improve their French language acquisition. And uh, because of the animals, it helps reduce anxieties, especially when it comes to like learning a new language. And this was extremely helpful for our new international students coming from either like the Philippines, Colombia, or even just Ontario. And it really helped them acquire the language a lot more. So uh, thanks to these organizations like Canadian Parents for French, uh, I, I highly encourage us all to, to take a look at uh, the services that they provide. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Uh, Emma, just for the sake of uh, not leaving the other group waiting too long. Um, I'm going to invite us to wrap up and, and say our thank yous. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you guys so much. Um, and thank you to our special guests. There's a great example as well from Michel Tegu in the chat. If you guys want to click on that link, you can see another story from SEDEC. Um, a very big thank you to Eric, Tarek, and Melanie for joining us for today's session. And a big thank you to all of you for your engagement and for sharing some of your very inspiring work. We appreciate what you do. It is so, so valuable.
Have a great and, um, rest of the day, guys. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Eric. Yes, I will just add that, as you mentioned uh, earlier, we provide words, uh, discourse, sentences, but you provide storylines, better storylines um, uh, to our ministers, for instance. So don't make it out loud what you do. Uh, meet, meet deputy ministers. You, you, uh, it, it will be a lot more efficient than just uh, ourselves providing words and frameworks. It helps. This is our job here. But really, just listening to you, you know, we, we're just landing uh, in the field and uh, elections are coming. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's good, but people must know what you do. Uh, the, uh, donc, les, les élus, les députés, les ministres uh, auraient avantage à entendre beaucoup ce que vous faites pour le vivre ensemble, entre autres au Québec. Merci d'être là. Uh, you make Merci. our work more uh, relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Merci, Eric. Um, thank you, everybody, as you log off. We hope you'll join us um, for the wrap up uh, for today. Ben, do we have any other instructions for that or just go back nope, to the log? Just, uh, just, just leave, leave and then join the wrap up. Thank you so much, everybody.